Welcome to Questions and Answers from Quarantine with Pastor Chris McMichael. Hello there. Welcome to episode 19 from Questions and Answers from Quarantine. I'm Chris McMichael coming to you from Tennessee where we are still on lockdown to some degree, maybe not as bad as some of the more progressive liberal totalitarian states. You can tell I'm getting a little irritated and bitter with all this thing, but nevertheless, we are still on some kind of gubernatorial mandate. I have an interesting question, probably a little bit deeper on the the theological side, but let me read it to you and we'll get into answering it. It, The question says, if the Lord permits, I'd like to ask about conditional and unconditional will of God. Is there such a thing? If so, could you please clarify Should true believers even worry about the distinction between both, and if there's a difference, which one should us as believers focus on to grow in our walk with God? So there's a lot there. That's a a pretty um, insightful question. Uh, I think as we distinguish it here in a minute, you'll see the difference. The best verse to start to unpackage and understand the will of God, well, first and foremost, I was going to say Romans 12. Let's go to Ephesians first. Um, I like to try to confront religion as best I can, not to say I don't have any religiosity in me. I certainly do. We all do. But one of the, most re- one of the more religious and ignorant things I hear from time to time is this: the following statement. Well, you just can't know what the Lord wants to do. His wills are mysterious. The way the Lord moves in mysterious ways, His wonders to behold. I mean, if you believe that, You're revealing that you don't study your Bible because the more you study your Bible, the more you'll understand God and his nature and the more you can predict or understand what he wants, what he's going to do, how he's going to respond. His entirety of his Bible, his holy book reveals to us his character, how he responds to things. It reveals his nature, um, his love, his anger, his wrath, his plan. And just like you can get to know your your natural father or even your natural boss or your natural sergeant in the military, and you can anticipate how they're going to respond or what they're going to want to do, if you know them, it's the same with our Heavenly Father. If you know Him, His will is not real mysterious. There'll be things you won't know for sure, but His will is not meant to be mysterious to us, not in the here and now, maybe, maybe off in the eschatological times of the end days, maybe in the millennial reign of Christ, maybe in the times and the dispensations to come, but not right now. This, this thing isn't whack-a-mole. It isn't a crapshoot. It isn't you're blindfolded shooting at a target hoping to hit the, hit the bullseye. That's not this at all. Look what Ephesians 5 says. Verse 17 says, Therefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Well, that would imply, if we work that verse backwards, that if I don't know what the will of the Lord is, then I am technically a fool, because the opposite of wisdom is foolishness. If you're unwise, you are a fool. Now look at 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual things, brethren... This is uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 1. I would not have you ignorant. I would not have you ignorant. So perhaps the first two things we need to say about the will of God is, number one, God wants us to have wisdom, and wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. But close, that's Proverbs. But closely after that, wisdom is knowing the will of the Father. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what the will of the Lord is. And number two, God does not want us ignorant of spiritual things. So that brings us to Romans 12, which is one of the best verses in the whole New Testament about the will of God. And then we'll get to this conditional versus unconditional will. So Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This just dawns on me while I'm reading it. Nearly every time you read a verse in the New Testament, there's a command being given. There's over 1,000 New Testament commandments, 1,050 approximately. Some of those repeat themselves. So when you remove all the ones that are duplicitous or, or have multiples, you get down to a little over right at 800 New Testament commands. Every time there's a commandment given, 
the will of God is revealed. God commands in line with his will. So just by reading verse 1, I, I lose ignorance and I gain wisdom. Lord, what do you want me to do today? Well, beseech, uh, present your bodies a living sacrifice. So Romans 12.1 gives me one of the 800 New Testament commands. So I have a command to present my body a living sacrifice, a holy sacrifice, an acceptable sacrifice. This is a reasonable service. So just by reading that one verse, I know a little bit more of the will of God. It's not mysterious. It isn't a wonder to behold. It's pretty plain Jane, written in black and white at an eighth grade level. I understand the will of God. Present my body. Be holy. Be clean. Stay healthy. Stay away from things that offend. Stay away from obesity. Present your body a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable, reasonable service. Verse 2. Be not conformed to this world. Well, there's another commandment. Now, see, we're on two out of 800. <laughs> Be not conformed to this world. That means don't model yourself like the world is. Don't follow the world. Don't conform to their image. Don't be like them in any way at all. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So here's a second commandment out of, a third commandment out of 800. Don't be conformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So now we're back to wisdom. When we're talking about the mind, we're back to wisdom. Renewing means to renovate, to overhaul. You don't gut your mind and tear it down when you get born again. You just room by room renovate the way you think, the way you emote, the way you want, the way you feel, the way you process, the way you reason so that it's in line with the Word of God. It'll take your whole life to get good at it. And then you'll be the time to go to heaven. Con don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. The only way you can be transformed is to have a mind that thinks like God. And that's why there's a lot of carnal Christians, because they just don't renew their mind. But watch this. Once you renew your mind, you'll be able to prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The more your mind thinks like the mind of Christ, the more your mind understands how God's nature is, how his law is set up, the more your mind understands the concepts of the kingdom, the laws of the kingdom, the, the cause and effect of the kingdom, the physics, if you would, the spiritual physics of the kingdom, the more you'll be able to prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The way I've taught this for years, a couple years ago, we actually brought out archery targets and we talked about the, the good will of God. At least you're aiming for the will of God. There's a good will. That is, it's, it's kind of the peripheral will. At least you're on target. But it's not exactly the acceptable will. So you move into a, a tighter circle of, of rings, which gives you a higher score card in archery. And then the perfect will, which would be the bullseye. And obviously we can, uh, when we're ignorant, when we're baby Christians, we're just trying to figure out which direction God is. <laughs> and we start generally walking his direction. And then you start realizing, oh, he, he wants me over there. So you start aiming in his direction. And the more you mature, the more you renew your mind, the more you start getting all your arrows on target to that goodwill. And then as you get better, you start to tighten up your grouping of arrows and you get into that acceptable will. And the more you mature and advance, you eventually get into that perfect will. And so that you're hitting bullseye over and over again. You're improving your accuracy. You're improving your, 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 your strength. You're improving your wisdom. You're improving your performance. And so as an example, uh, let, me, let me perhaps use an extreme one. Uh, maybe not an extreme one. Uh, let's say you're praying, Lord, do I go to college? Lord, do I go to college? And the Lord answers you and says, yes, uh, you have peace. Go to college. All right, that's the good will of God. You've nailed it. You're going to go to college. You're not going to stay at home and do nothing. Okay? But that doesn't mean you get to go to any college. So now you've got to go and visit schools, be led by the Holy Spirit, visit a bunch of them, and now you've got to figure out which college do you want me to go to, Lord? And let's say you nail down the right college. Great. I'm at the right college. I've gone from the good will of God, which was attending college, to the acceptable will of God, which is the right college. Lord, what would you have me major in? Because I, I, you told me to go here. You told me to attend. I'm at the right college. What, what would you have me to major in? And so maybe he speaks to you geology. Maybe he speaks to you nursing. Maybe he speaks to you secondary education. Now you've lined up all the things. Go to college. Go to Tennessee Tech. Uh, 
do nursing. And now you can say you're in the good, acceptable, and perfect will. But what if, what if you, you went to the right college, but it wasn't the right major? What if you weren't even supposed to go to college? What if you're supposed to go to a vocational school? What if you're supposed to apprentice in your dad's company? See, there's all these things that we got to realize there are, there are conical, uh, the geology terms, isoplethic. Um, there are different degrees to the will of God. Good, acceptable, perfect. Now, Pastor Vaughn used to say years ago in teaching on this, he said, let's just be honest, though. If you're going to finish your race, there's only one will of God, the perfect will of God. Now, as I help our young people, our high school and college kids and our young adults, I like to use the analogy of a, of a, a, um, a siphon, not a siphon, a funnel. Excuse me, a funnel. So if you, you're familiar with the funnel, whether you're pouring oil with the funnel or gasoline with the funnel, a funnel is shaped like a cone. And then at the very bottom of the funnel, you have this tight little spout that gets the fuel or the oil or whatever your fluid is into that smaller hole. Uh, very, very few people are good enough just to take a five-quart thing of motor oil, take the lid off their engine, and just eyeball it and not pour half a quart all over their engine block. That's why you use a funnel. Very few people in the Bible, with the exception of maybe Jesus Christ and Samuel, the boy prophet, could just start off as a child and eyeball from three meters pouring a quart of oil straight into the engine block hole that's only about two inches, maybe three. (laughs) <laughs> so for our young people, I use the example of this funnel that when you're first walking with God and you, you leave home, you go to college, there's a lot of bumping around as you discover the will of God. And he, he gives you grace to kind of go this direction a little bit and start to feel the rumble strips or the bumper of, nah, I don't need to be hanging out with that crowd. So you start to come over here, I don't need to be taking that kind of job after class. I don't need to be watching these kind of movies. And as you're advancing in life towards Christ, he is slowly narrowing the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So you're getting better. You're improving your performance, your accuracy, uh, your consistency. You could take, for example, um, marriage, love, true love, marriage. (laughs) Take for marriage, for example. What about the Bible tells you to marry but only in the Lord. That's the good will of God. Okay, but so I, well, let's back up. Let me back up. Let me adjust my example. The Bible says marriage is good. So you're going to get married. Praise God. That's the good will of God. Unless it's a total pagan. Then, then it's not the will of God. But let's say now you advance and you marry the right, you marry a Christian. You, or you're courting a Christian girl or you're courting a Christian boy, man, woman. Okay, so... That's the good will of God. Well, what if they're not equally yoked? What if you're a tongue talker and they are a cessationist? They believe tongues is of the devil. Well, even though you're both born again, you, that's not going to be acceptable. So you got to fall back. You could get married. It's going to be rough. You're going to butt heads. You're going you're to have a lot of issues. But concerning marriage, marriage is the will of God. You marry someone of like faith, you pray and you hear from heaven, and you get God's green light for that perfect person for you. You don't just marry anybody. And uh, a lot of folks did, and they're hurting 30 years later. And they're not going to get divorced, but boy, they probably wish they'd had better teaching 30 years prior. What about ministry? Let's say for me as example, I recognize I'm called to the ministry. That's the goodwill of God. Let's say I recognize I'm not supposed to be a missionary, but a pastor. Well, so I don't go to the mission field, which would have not been the will of God, but to stay in the States and pastor, that's the acceptable will of God. What if I'm pastoring a Lutheran church in Duluth? Not the perfect will of God. It's possible to be in the will of God and it not be a bullseye. You're on target, praise God, but you're not bullseye. And what we as Christians ought to do is aim for the bullseye over and over and over again. So hopefully you can see that. You can, we got a lot of folks that belong at our church here in our town, but they quit or they got offended. And so they've gone across town five minutes or even three minutes to another church. So they're in the will of God, kind of, because they're in church and that's the will of God, but they're not in the church they belong at and they didn't leave right. So they'll never be in the perfect will of God, though they're in a church in the same town they're supposed to be in. 
So hopefully you can see that. I, I think that uh, the visual of a target, of an archery target, works the best. Good, acceptable, and perfect. And the more your mind is renewed, the more you'll understand how to hit bullseye every time you let that arrow go, every time you make a decision. And even if you're off left or right, that's okay. You just walk it back on. That's a, that's a, um, a shooting term. And then when you walk your gun, you sight it on and you walk it on target. It's all right if you miss from time to time. You readjust. I say it this way. If you miss, at least miss with a good heart. Miss aiming for the bullseye. And if you miss aiming for the bullseye and you can see you're down into the right or high into the left or whatever, then you can adjust next time you make the same decision or maybe in the same course of decision making. Uh, one of our church family members, they shared with me a story years ago when they first graduated and were married. They took a job. They prayed about it. They took a job and they left Tennessee and they moved up to somewhere in the Midwest to a major city. And they said they got there believing it was the will of God, had prayed about it, got there absolutely miserable, had committed to a job, an entry level career in their field of study and looked at each other and said, we are out of the will of God. I mean, they weren't even on target. <laughs> they, they'd overshot the target. They'd, they'd wing that thing to the left. They looked at each other, and I don't remember the time frame. It was less than two weeks. They turned around and moved right back to Tennessee. You can do that. Whatever you do, you've got to be on target, and you've got to be aiming for the bullseye where all the peace and provision of God is. Now, I had to say all that to answer this question about conditional and unconditional will of God. Does God's will have conditions? Yes and no. Let me say this. We know that many are called, so the, and we would say, as we believe that God's called everybody to salvation, so we could say the unconditional will of God is that the will of God is everybody must be born again. That is the will of God, unconditionally. He wants everybody to be born again. Is everybody going to be born again? No. So does God get what he wants? No, he doesn't get what he wants. Not all the time, not in everybody's life, not ever. So the unconditional will of God is for everyone to be born again. But to be born again, there are conditions. To be born again, you must call upon the name of the Lord. You must humble yourself. You must confess your sin. It's by uh, grace through faith, not of works. So to fulfill the unconditional will of God, there are conditions. Is healing the unconditional will of God for all of mankind? Absolutely. He wants us to be healed. But are there conditions to divine health? Absolutely. You've got to receive by faith. You've got to walk in love. You've got to forgive. You've got to partake of the Lord's table worthily. There's a lot of conditions built into that thing. What about many are called to the ministry? That's an unconditional calling. I was called, like Paul said in Ephesians, uh, from my mother's womb, called to the ministry, not of man, but by God. So that's an unconditional calling. But for me to be chosen to be a minister or a pastor, I had to fulfill a lot of conditions. Paul said, uh, he said, I'm th I, I thank God who after he counted me worthy, that's a condition, he counted me worthy, he put me into the ministry. So we have unconditional will requiring conditions to fulfill it. And then what about, um, back to the marriage thing. Is marriage the will of God? Yes, unconditionally. It is not good for man to be alone. Be fruitful and multiply. Two great commands. Builds a wonderful doctrine called marriage. Can you marry anybody you want to? No. No, you as a Christian don't get to marry anybody you want to. You don't get to be like Samson and say, Dad, get her. She pleaseth me. You don't get to be like that. So even though marriage is the unconditional will of God, there are conditions to be met to find the will that is holy matrimony. And hopefully this is kind of making sense. Um, I did some research. There is no official doctrine on conditional or unconditional will. Um, the closest you get maybe are conditional and unconditional promises. There are conditional and unconditional promises. The promise of healing, we could look at it from that way, is unconditional, but there are conditions to be met. He has promised healing, but you must meet it. There are there are promises that we have nothing to do with, like the rapture, the coming of Christ. The first and second advent of Christ have nothing to do with mankind. They happen in the fullness of time. So those are unconditional. They're going to happen. <laughs> the lake of fire at the end of the millennial reign, unconditional. You can't do anything about it. 
Uh, Noah's flood, couldn't nothing be done about it. Unconditional. There are some divine judgments that are just totally unconditional. They're just going to happen. My last example was really fitting for this coronavirus thing. If we think about uh, Chronicles 714, the will of God is to heal our land. That's the unconditional will of God. He wants it. And yet, if my people who were called by my name, if, 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 which means conditions will follow. If my people who were called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. So there's four conditions to obtain the unconditional will of God. God wants it with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. But in order for him to do it, in order for him to hear from heaven, we've got to meet his four conditions. If, if we'll fulfill those four conditions as his people, he's not looking for the pagans to repent. He's looking for his people to repent. Then he'll hear from heaven and he'll heal our, our land. So hopefully that answers that. The conditional versus the unconditional will of God, or I would say the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Trust your praying. Only the church can turn this thing quicker. Here in the state of Tennessee, we're cursing it. We, we have seen our curve flatline very quickly. Our, by the time this thing will air, our, uh, our curve will have been flattened for probably over a week. We're still scratching our head as to why we're still under this weird lockdown, but I don't know. We're praying for a lot of wisdom, too. Stay safe out there. Stay in prayer. We'll see you in the next episode. Be blessed.